Welcome to another exciting episode of Prepper Talk Radio. This is the podcast for the prepared and those who want to be with your hosts, Scott, Shane, and Paris. And you'll notice today, Shane, if you're watching, has a green glow about him. Ooh, look at my hand. Look at glow. His aura is on fire today. He's uh, just I need a real studio instead of a green screen. But why is it glowing <laughs> green? This is not I'm not AI, I am real. Well, we were I was gonna say that you were joining us via a AI interface and that the real Shane was lost somewhere, but there there goes that joke. I'm I'm fine with that. But uh wanna wanna first point out before we jump into our topic, which is all about water, water preparedness, storage, filtration treatment where when why how all the things you need to know about water just a reminder you guys check out learn.itmtrading.com forward slash prepper talk radio to learn about gold and silver not just what you can do with it but how you can invest it um, these guys have put together a special offer free consultation for anyone who wants to use the services guys i uh, want to remind you our sponsor for the show today is your favorite and my favorite location to get all of your emergency medical prescriptions, medications. When you're not by a pharmacy and you need one, you're in trouble unless you've got a Jace case. Check out jacemedical.com and use the code PREPPERTALK to save $10 at checkout. They have a one-year bundle you can get. They also have ivermectin, which has been discounted, and a bunch of other stuff that you can get for your daily medications through through their website. And it's 100% what we all have. That's why we talk about it all the time. Check them out, jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Now, water. I lo love this stuff. I've got a water bottle with me pretty much all the time. If you're watching on the video, I just showed you one. But water. if we have no water, we're screwed. Like the emergency rule of threes we talk about, the first and most important thing is oxygen, right? Three minutes of that air, your brain starts going cattywampus and parts die off. Uh, three hours without shelter, and you can die of uh, heat exhaustion. You can exposure. die of um, exposure, you know, cold temperatures, losing fingers. That's when things start going bad, right? It can go really bad really fast. Mm -hmm. The next one is water. Notice how we haven't talked about food. Food is the last thing you got to worry about. Water, however, you can go three, sometimes a little longer, typically days without water. So you want to make sure you have a lot of that stored, and we recommend at least 30 days. But to help simplify it, Paris Paris has an amazing slideshow that we're going to talk about while we're doing this episode. So yep. that reminds me to remind you, make sure you're checking us out over on YouTube so you can see what we're talking about. I was listening to um, somebody who's into uh, health and fitness, and they were saying something about food. You can go 30 days without food, and it might be three weeks, which is actually more, more appropriate. And then the water is three or four days. And so the idea that he was getting at in this conversation was that some of the reason why, you know, when you feel hunger pains, your body is actually designed to go a lot longer without food than it is without water. And so if you're feeling hungry and you feel like you got to go eat or snack or you're, you know, trying to, you know, you open the pantry and you grab for the first thing there, it's more likely that you're thirsty than that you're hungry. And so fill yourself with water first. If you get those munchies, whenever time of day it is, if you get the munchies, fill your body with water first and see if that doesn't satiate you in such a way that you're going to be able to worry, you know, avoid those um, late night snacks or avoid those snacks you shouldn't be eating probably anyways. And that'll keep you uh, more physically fit, more healthy, because uh, we need more water than we do um, Doritos and, you know, so you you're know. saying I should sign up for Noom, right? Ooh, well, it's more, it's more of a mental thing, right? It's more mental. We're not sponsored right. by Noom. <laughs> We're not, I'm just saying, you know, that's more about, <laughs> about shaping the way you think, the way the things you believe, right? I mean, we believe that we have to eat three times a day. We believe we have to, oh, I'm hungry. I can stop wherever I want and go eat, right? Like I said, that's not, where did, are not true, right? Where did that rule three square meals a day come from, from our darn government fda probably yeah well it, it was an agreement between the fda and um it was the pork association now what happened was this is the craziest story i learned this a few months ago and i'm like what so breakfast became the most important meal of the day as a 
FDA funded through the pork association they basically said we can't sell bacon we don't know what to do with this stuff we need to sell it and this group of marketing geniuses came came together and said just cook it separate put it in slices tell people it's part of the most important meal of the day which is now breakfast and they're like what's breakfast they're like oh it's this first meal of the day day you have to have this in the morning otherwise you're like a day and profits through the roof the fda got paid a ton of money pork Sellers made a ton of money, and that's where it came from. We used to not eat typically till noon or one o'clock every day. Wow. And oftentimes it was one meal a day. Like if you were poor, it was always one meal a day. Mm -hmm. If you're wealthy, it was typically two, and then sometimes a late night snack or dessert or whatever else. Yeah, the food pyramid is bogus. Yeah. And it's just funny to me because I freaking love bacon, and my whole life is now is a lie. Right. <laughs> because bacon. They just it, they couldn't sell it. It was throwaway meat. That's crazy. And now it's become its own thing, and it's like, hey, you want to buy a pound of bacon? Give me eighty bucks. Yeah, now you can have a pound well, of bacon. You you, you could have a pound of bacon now. Oh, that's funny. So when I go off grid, I'm gonna have my chickens, and I'm probably gonna get a pig to slaughter every year. But man, that, gotta have that bacon. It's, it's all a lie. You don't need three square meals, but you do need. But water. also, like, you do need water. And what's interesting is, is you need. Like I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm going to store a bunch of Gatorade. And I'm like, yeah, that really doesn't hydrate you like it says. Like if you read all the studies, all those those hydration specialty drinks mm -hmm. don't hydrate you. Mm -hmm. What they do is they flood your cells with non-absorbable non -absorbable water. And if you go look and do any research on running and runners dying of, oh, what's it called? when they started running like Gatorade and everything else, they started having all these runners start dying or suffering issues of um, the same as if you're drowning. And mm -hmm. it's because they're flooding the cells with water that's not absorbable. And so then your body starts to shut down in different ways. And I'm like, what? Well, haven't you seen the movie Idi Idiocracy, right? It has electrolytes. Right. <laughs> but what, what are real <laughs> electrolytes? It's Put electrolytes on the crops, just, right? Yeah, baking soda and and salt gives you the electrolytes you need. Throw a little dash of that in. Tastes horrible. Works great. Right, and I'm just going to add on top of that. You know, not just water needs to be pure water. Needs to be clean water. And so we we advocate for for water filtration. Uh, like we love the water, the Berkey water filter. Right, because it takes out the chlorine, it takes out the uh, heavy metals and such, and <clears throat> gives you good pure water. And that's essential for for health. But obviously, in an emergency. Water is water. If you're if you're thirsty, I mean, you'll drink a puddle of water, right? A puddle of dirty water. Yeah, so it, it can get pretty bad. I, some people will even drink their own pee, and I I wouldn't. That's not me. I'm not going to be one of those guys. We can address that myth if you'd like. Water Water World. Go for it. I saw that with Kevin Costner. Water World with Kevin Costner. No, I think uh, I, from what I understand, the myth about drinking your own urine is that. I mean, it is, it is obviously has a lot of uh, electrolytes in it, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you can you can do that at first, right? If but then if you're if you're thirsty and, and you can drink that at first, it will probably help. But it, when it starts to get very yellow and concentrated, it, it works against you. So yeah. if if it's uh, very clear, okay, and you're in an emergency situation, you know you're not going to have water for an extended period of time, okay, right? At, at that part but then yeah once it gets that, concentrated yeah. it's, it's it becomes toxic you. well it's interesting if you guys remember, what's the movie is it 20 23 or whatever it's the it's long i don't know it's Air, the story of aaron ralston the rock climber yeah who that's what lost, i was thinking of yeah he got his 20, hand stuck underneath 27 the hours is that what it was 17 hours Sem 17 hours mm -hmm. i'll do a good he, here his story is pretty fantastic what got him through all of that he did have to drink his own pee at one 127 hours 127 oh. hours there you go we were way off way yeah. off but he drank he drank his own pee in that story mm -hmm. right in that real life situation and he says it was both a, a, a benefit but also a detriment because it sped up the toxification of his body but the benefit was is it kept him alive long enough to be able to do what he needed to do which was cut off his own hand and crawl out so the the lesson is let's not cut off our own hands let's store water right let's be prepared. store water and don't climb sketchy walls. by yourself right by yeah. yourself yeah 
and not tell anybody where you're going, you know, where you're, where you're not. Going. So let's, so. let's pull that slide back up real quick. Um, so we're going to go over a couple of different things in, in this water crash course, right? Water 101. Why you should store water, we've kind of been talking about. How much do you need? We're going to jump into that next. Where and how basically to store it? Um, what kind of containers? Um, and then also how to sanitize those. And then do you need to treat it? Do you not need to treat it? Um, and then other sources of water. This, the other sources of water is one of my favorites um, because this goes into some of the household things you might have. But I also want you to think about the th things not in your house and other places you can find water. Um, and you should break out a map and identify those so that you can easily get back to them when you need it, if if you need it. If you have an extended period of time where you're going to be out of um, services, you're going to want to know how to go get more water because you can't store water for years. It's just too much. It's too big of a, of a, of a burden. So you've got to have a way, once your water storage goes out, you got to have a way to go replenish that. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about. So um, obviously, we talked about why we should store water. Top water is a top priority in an emergency. You would you will live longer with good, clean water than you will with a bunch of food. So if you're going to focus, obviously, get your 30-day pantry, your 90-day pantry, your food storage. But if you don't have water storage, you're you're not going to make it. So make sure you have water storage. So the next question is, how much do you need? And this is a decent um, graph or chart. Uh, basically, what it says is, um, if you, depending on your family size, so if you have, you, you go down here on the left side, it says family size one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one week, two weeks, and one month. And this is one gallon per person per day as the bare bones minimum. And so screenshot this page for those of you watching, screenshot this page and add this to your preparedness binder. Yeah. And then three gallons per person per day is probably going to be more, way more beneficial to your family and then it's one week two weeks and one month and then you want to get at least i would say 90 days so if you have five people in your house and you you want to have uh 420 gallons that'll, that'll last you a month and so at three gallons per person per day and why do you need three gallons per person per day because it's, it's well um uh, on an average day if you're sitting at my if i'm sitting at my desk right if we're not if i'm not exercising or or, or working outside a half a gallon of water is what I'm going to drink at minimum. Mm -hmm. Minimum mm -hmm. is what I should be drinking, right? Really, I should probably be drinking more. So that's where that one gallon per per person per day. But but that doesn't include any hand washing, any dish, you know, dish washing, any flushing toilets, anything like that. That's cooking. That's why we're cooking exactly. So one gallon, yes, in a survival situation, you could get get away with one gallon per person per day. But it you could be so much more comfortable with two or three gallons. Absolutely. So here's an interesting fact. When you take a five minute shower, you've used over 10 gallons of water. Wow. Most people take 10 minutes to 15 minutes in the shower. So when disaster strikes, sponge bath. don't think about showers. Think about sponge baths, mm -hmm. right? Think about conserving that water. You're not going to want to bathe every day just because you're going to have to preserve as much water as you can. Well, that's where the, um, saying, the saying of uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater came is that literally they'd fill the tub up once mm -hmm. and usually the dad or the mom got to go first because mm -hmm. it was still hot. And then all the kids bathed in the same bathtub. And by the time the baby was uh, t was uh, turns to go, it was dark and black and you probably couldn't see the baby. That's why they were like, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater bath because water, you can't see him. And that's how they could serve the water for, yeah. you know, I'll, I don't know how long, but for our, and our ancestors that's how they did it and that's a yeah. way to think about and it. and then you could take that water and water some plants with it you could fill your toilet up so, so you could flush it uh don't just let it go down the drain like here's something i practice uh on a regular basis is and and since i have uh kind of a bug out location i practice conserving water and the way i do that do that is in the sink when i'm washing dishes right i mean it's instead of letting the the tap run right i i fill up I, I stack my pots. I stack my plates so that the largest are on the bottom, the smallest are on the top, and I can wash kind of like with the, the dad starting out with his shower, right? I wash the small ones yep. and then use that same water to wash the ones below. As long as it's, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. It's not too dirty. Uh, but I will scrub the dishes first and get rid of, you know, any, any of the debris and then use as little practice as using as little water as I can to scrub and then rinse. 
and it really only takes really a couple of gallons at most to do you know a pretty good dinner uh if you're doing it if you're doing it efficiently yeah yeah I think that's the thing. It's like we've forgotten. That's the the problem with modern technology today, and all the modern amenities of life, is we've forgotten how to do simple things like calculate what you actually need to clean your dishes and mm-hmm. use the the least amount possible to do your dishes. Mentally, a lot of people are going to break down and suffer when things go sideways because they're not going to know how to do all these things because they haven't practiced it. They haven't put themselves in a in a voluntary state of disaster to go through and see what can they really do without doing that you're going to be up the creek no matter what comes your way but if you start practicing little things like that you're going to be much better off when things really do go sideways and then if if the emergency is extended beyond a week or two and you've been wise with your water you may have extra at that point and instead of running out like oh Mm -hmm. we use too much and you know what Practice now on on using that water and how, how long it's going to uh, last instead of getting to the end of it and wondering how you're going to get more water. Exactly. Well, it's just like the theory or the not the theory, the practice of tornado drills, of earthquake drills, of fire drills. You Growing up in public schools, you've probably all experienced that. And how often did you do it? Once a when year. When I was in grade school, it was once a month. Really, yeah. When I was in high school, it was once a quarter. So depending on where you grew up, like it might be different, but you should be doing those with your kids, with your husband and wife, whatever your family situation is, you should be doing that. And then taking that to your water and practicing with your water. I like taking my family camping and saying, here's all the water we have. Have Good luck. Because then we really limit what we do. You know, kids don't leave water bottles to be tossed away. They have half drank. They hold on to those things because they know they're not getting another one. Yeah. And then when they come home, they don't throw water, water out. At least not for a little while. Then I see him doing it. And I'm like, hey, hey, hey. Get back in the habit, yeah. Right? The but next... you've got to practice it. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to be prepared for it. Yeah. And we'll talk more about it, about that once we get to the section where it's um, where we're talking about other sources of water. But the next section here is uh, a great question. This is a, something that a lot of people want to know. Where should I store my water? And this isn't just necessarily the location, but like in what kind of a container, too. And we'll talk a little bit about the containers in a minute, but the um, I would the, the most important place to store water is in a typically a cold place and uh, not it, that's not in direct sunlight because sunlight is going to give you the uh, or it creates algae and you don't want algae growing in your water and you want to keep air you want to keep it as tight as possible because the air can get in there with the sunlight and it and then you want to have containers that are dark or um, blue, you know, the blue, typical blue barrels are, are the ones that everybody knows about. So anything that's dark, if it's clear and it's in the sun and there's air available, you guaranteed you're going to have some algae at some point. So don't do that to yourself. Um, get as tight as possible, uh, dark as possible, and put it in as much shade as possible, like the side of the house with a tarp or something like that. What do you guys say? Yeah, absolutely. So I have you know, mine stored. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, my, like it says here, garage is a great location. That's where I have uh, mine stored. I have uh, those IBC totes, right? They're much too large to fit in the house, but they're very cost effective. They're very uh, inexpensive compared to the larger tanks you can actually fit in the house, fit downstairs that you're, you know, you, you'll get into that for several hundred dollars for, uh, you know, five, five, six hundred gallons worth of, of water storage where I was, I'm into mine probably 300 dollars for 550 gallons wow. uh, they are food grade store food storage grade food grade containers uh, never had chemicals in them and i do have them wrapped in a blue tarp but they are you know we do our garage faces north so sun rarely gets in uh, and i've been doing this for are they over, right ten, by, over 10 years now is that is that what was right by your house um right when the garage door opens it's right there yeah. yep okay i was like what? you got this tarp right here when i went to go yeah, and I use, for, use it for storage on top. I haven't parked in my garage for almost 13 years. <laughs> so I've been doing a, a test with those same IBC totes. Um, I bought mine for $45 each. I've got three of those in the backyard. I, I put a white tarp over them and filled them all up. Um, I left one untarped, two tarped, and then I used water out of one to water my garden. 
Um, the other two, I just used potable water from the house. I've stored those for two years. Nothing grow, grown in those two. The one that I used on my garden, which I left uncovered, I wanted to see what would happen. And it wasn't until I got it down to about a fourth full that things started to actually grow. Hmm. If I kept it half full or more, never had a problem, even even in direct sunlight, which was, to me, it's kind of yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, but that's over a two-year period. In the last year, when I had it low, that's when a problem happened. I also have water tanks on the north side of my house that stay out of the sun and that are blue. And those are 55 gallons. And I have not rotated the water in those for six years and they're outside. So they get all the elements, they get all the problems that everybody else gets, right? But, you know, we have 100 plus degree heat in the summer. Um, but the thermal mass of the water, that's the best thing about it. The larger the container that you can store your water in, the better it's going to do against the elements, right? In your garage, your garage can get extremely hot. But if it's 270 gallons or 250 gallons, it's not going to get that hot. Why? Because the thermal mass, the property of the more the more water in one tiny location, the better it's going to be at holding its temperature. And it'll stay cooler than the area around it. Mm -hmm. So garages are a pretty good place, even in hot climates, mm -hmm. to keep that water. Now, if you can keep it in a colder place, keep it in a colder place. But definitely keep it in a dark place. Keep it out of the sun. Tarp it or spray the outside of it dark, like blue or black, um, so that the light's not going through it if you can't tarp it. But uh, we tested it with a black tarp on some other ones, and they're, they're doing just fine, too. So... Yeah, a few other quick tips is when you're f filling and draining these barrels, uh, your barrels or totes or whatever you have, make sure either you have a dedicated hose for that that's clean, mm -hmm. right? You don't want something that's sitting outside and is getting bugs and debris and whatever, uh, but uh, something that is, you know, is clean, you're comfortable with that, that is not going to induce any any bacteria and that's going to help it uh, last longer, longer as well. And we then... Uh, grade, we actually have food grade hoses. And so I... Yes. Yep. That. Yeah. And you can go to the RV store and get a dedicated white hose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, or gray hose for the for the drain, you know, or just a garden hose, what I use to, to drain the water out. But. Yeah, mine mine's a garden hose to drain and a food grade to fill. And you can get those at RV stores. You can also get them on Amazon, but you have to look for um, RV potable water mm -hmm. um, intake pipe or intake hose. And then how you store that is important as well. Store it indoors yeah. and not in a shed or anything like that. Well, because it's rubber. I mean, it's rubber and plastics. And if you leave that out in the sun, what's going to happen? It's going to degrade. Yeah. And the insides are going to fall apart. The outsides are going to fall apart. And guess what? Now you're drinking whatever is falling in apart. your hose. Yeah. yeah one and thing too to remember is that if you're going to store it in your garage, I would highly recommend you put it up on a cinder block and then put a um, like a tube, a piece of plywood underneath it so that you don't have, at, you know, plastic is stuff can seep through those. It's it's not. A, impermeable um, surface so you know the, you, you don't want to be drinking your water and it tastes like cement because you had it right up against the you know, ground so that's just you know tips over years and years and years is probably not going to you know you probably find that it seeps in but um it's just you know good practices uh it may or may it may be wise tale but it just seems like a good practice to me well, the other thing I remember too is like what going back to what scott was saying about the elements is that it, the thermodynamics of water is we talked about having um you know, when we were talking about the winter, uh, preparing for the winter is to make sure that your barrels have a little bit of room for the water to expand. And I, I, I was talking to somebody else about that. And they're like, no, those 55 gallon drums, it barely expands because uh, there's so much water that it doesn't actually freeze the whole of the, of the barrel. So mm -hmm. it only kind of freezes maybe an inch or two on the top. So it's not as demanding or it's not as uh, critical for you to leave the room, but still probably a good idea to leave some room if you know if you yeah. have those barrels on the outside if you're in an area that snows anyways what were you going to say scott well i was just going to say part of the reason they, they talk about a lot of putting a barrier between your concrete and the plastic um, is because the old method of concrete had a leach off issue um, and same with the plastics they would actually absorb the leach off from concrete um, now the way the concrete's made it's not an issue um okay but it's still better not to leave it on the on there because the concrete's going to bring in whatever whatever heat or cold you may not want to be brought to that container. So that's why now they talk about barriers. Um, 
putting a little piece of wood, a couple slats of wood between it and the ground, fantastic. It just raises it off the ground a little bit so that there's um, a separation of that conductivity of either heat or cold. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're watching the picture now, we've got some other examples here of, of different ways you can hold water. Um, I do like the tower on the right. Um, in my mm -hmm. next place, we're going to be doing one of those systems because you can put it in line with your water in your home where it runs through that tank and it's just always staying full. The problem with that, though, is if the water gets cam contaminated in the city source, I've contaminated that container. Mm -hmm. But I never have to worry about rotating it as long as it's connected, right? And as long as you, if you have so one. I always like having some connected and some not. Well, if you have one of these big tanks, or even the one in the middle here, this blue one, you'll see that the spigot is really close to the ground. So if you don't have that up off the ground a little bit, you're going to have a hard time trying to get the hose hooked on there to get it drained. So that's another reason to have a little bit of a barrier between the ground and your your um, these these types of tanks, anyway. Yeah, and some of these tanks will will they will have thought of that and will have made provisions for that. But yeah, as you can see, these larger tanks are made to fit through a door to get down in your basement, whereas an IBC tote will not. You know, it's a, it's a 36 to 48 inches, 42 inches wide. It's like, it's like, it's, yeah. it's on a pallet essentially. So it is up off the ground. They're, they're a great option, but you want to find a food grade one that has not uh, had chemicals in it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so but yeah, uh, other recommendations, can... there's, you know, you can use old juice containers. You can use, uh, I started off and I know I've said this a, a number of times. We started off using um, soda bottles, which is, which work great. Although you still have to change the water once a year or you know, yeah. maybe twice a year, depending on where you have it. And at one point we had a couple hundred of these bottles and it was just so tedious to try and, and uh, empty and, and rinse them out and refill them that it just got rid of them and just go with a bigger tank. Start with bigger, like Scott saying, start with bigger. Well, the nice thing is, is it's, it's easier to manage, maintain, and you don't have to mm -hmm. rotate it as, as often, right? Like I said, Much I've got easier. water on the side of my house. It's been there for over five years. It's six years now. And I test it every year and there's no algae growth. There's nothing problem. We had one barrel go bad where there's algae growth on the threads because the, the ice formed on top of it and it cracked the, the threading. And if you're right? concerned, you can filter it or you can treat it before you exactly. drink it. And that was the next point. Mm -hmm. the, that barrel's busted now because it won't thread correctly, but I could still store water in it. Mm-hmm. And then I can treat that water when I'm ready to drink it. The other thing and that's why it's so good to have filters. And filter, other, filter, filter. The other thing I would say is have a smaller container, like this, these ones on the left hand side if you're watching. So oh, if yeah. you have a big if you have a big 500, 250, you know, whatever tank, um, and the hose doesn't reach, it'd be a lot easier to to put it into a five gallon tank and then carry that for um, port portability. So you want your potable mm -hmm. water in a big tank, and then you have these smaller um, containers. So you can have your potable water portable. Uh, that's a tongue twister, I think. <laughs> Is your potable water portable? Portable, portable, potable, potable water. That's, I think that's one of the biggest problems with large water storage is people don't think about how am I going to move the water. Yeah, you got to drain it. You know, I've got I've got water below my my home, and one of my big challenges is getting all the water up. And so yeah, I've actually learned how to do a gravity fed ram pump to push all the water back up my hill. And that yeah. is powerless. It does it on its own. It took me a while to get it figured out, <laughs> but it works. But figure it out now before you actually need it. Right? Exactly. And you can go get the stuff at the hardware store pretty easy. It, it cost me, I think, $110. But so I did it wrong the first time. So the last thing I'll say on this picture here is um, it literally says that, you know, Costco, it says Costco brand there, but it's the uh, water bottles. You know, how many water bottles should we store and should we store water bottles? I have the water bottles in my rotation in my 90 day pantry. So I, I have 11 um, cases of five gallon, the 40 water bottle uh, cases. Uh, I have 11 of those in my house almost as, as consistently as I can. Uh, as we go through one, I replace it. And sometimes we get down to 10 or nine, but it's usually pretty consistent. And then that's going to be your grab and go. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to have a big old tank or a big five, like five, five gallon container is 40 pounds. So that's a lot. So if you can grab five or six water bottles in your pack and grab and go, then that you're going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot easier anyway. So I definitely would recommend getting water bottles as well, but don't be that, that shouldn't be your long-term storage. <laughs> you know, you yeah, I agree. You know, we have, have no water bottles in our, uh, at our house whatsoever. 
Um, and I think a lot of that is really ha having to do with recycling and what it does to the environment and such. But they are definitely handy. I, I, on occasional, I will you know ha grab some from a friend and stick them in my my truck, right? Because they're awfully handy. Uh, but uh, but I think uh, you know it's and I see a lot of people grabbing these and and stashing them away. And and I think unless you're very careful at rotating them, uh, I don't know the shelf life of that pair. Does it say a they shelf life on long. those packs? No, yeah. it's not very long because the the plastic isn't very good and it, it gets yeah. into the water. And so I I, I literally rotate. I probably drink a case in my house. We drink a case a week or so, 10 days. And so we go through them enough to rotate them. And that's what mm -hmm. I, that's why I feel good about it. Okay. Yeah. I think if you're rotating them, then you're probably fine. All right. Yeah. I've had water in one of those for about eight months. And when we tested it later, it was bad. Oh, really? So here's, yeah, speaking, of that, in the garage. speaking of that, here's some do's and don'ts about not storing water. Um, store, do store multiple size containers, small and large that we talked about purchase food grade containers. So we already talked about some of these. It says, um, if you do decide to repurpose your soda or juice storage containers, choose two liter plastic soft drink bottles because they're a lot bigger and easier. But then mm -hmm. under the don'ts, never use plastic milk jugs because they mm -hmm. break down way too easy. They're actually designed to break down in landfills. So those water milk jugs are, those gallon milk jugs are not really good for water storage. And the and lids do not seal tight. Yeah. For and sure. the glass containers are just too heavy and fragile. Now, storing well, storing water in glass is not a problem if it's in a cold, dry place, mm -hmm. cold, yeah. dark place. It, but the fragility is the issue. That it like always has been, always will be. So, I know a lot of people who, when they um, do canning and they need to fill an extra spot in their canning, in their pressure canner, or they'll fill it with water and can that, and then put that water in there, and that's fine because mm -hmm. it's good for eighteen months. Um, but they put it in a cold, dark place. But again, if you knock it over, that sucker's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next question here is, does my water need to be treated and how do I do that? And uh, you can read the bullet points there, but I would say um, if you're going to use water from uh, from the from the city or from the, you know, your, for your tap or your hose, you'd probably be okay to, to um just put it in the container in the storage container and then treat it later. Um, if you're collecting it off of uh, maybe the roof or if you're collecting it from rain, then you probably want to treat it um, as it goes into the storage because you're going to get, mm -hmm. you know, the, the chlorine, there's already bleach ish products, chlorine, fluoride, etc., in the city water. So you're going to have the mm -hmm. ability to have it store way better. And that's what you would put into uh, your storage. Anyways, you would just put a couple drops of bleach in there. And chlorine is already in the city water usually uh, in small enough amounts to keep it from generating any kind of algae or whatnot. But uh, it's, as long as you're storing in the right place, you shouldn't need a ton to, to, of chemicals or treatments. Uh, I did for, I bought a treatment and I have a 260 gallon drum and I put a five year treatment in there just mm -hmm. to keep it just for now. Just a know, copper and silver type solution. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it, it, it won't hurt you to do it. It won't hurt you to treat your water ahead of time, but you don't always need to if it's especially if it's from the city. Yeah, Agreed. exactly. All right, let's uh, move to the next thing here. Oh, basically the same things. Uh, it's bullet points, more bullet points on that in this presentation here. All right, other sources of water. So in the home, we've got things like your hot water tank, all the piping in your house, right? Um, ice cubes, whatever might be frozen in the freezer, right? Um, those are things you can drink. The, the things you don't want to be drinking, but you can use for other things or the toilet water. But when they talk about that, they're talking about the water in the tank, not the water in the bowl. Mm -hmm. The water in the tank, much, much, much more usable elsewhere. Water in the bowl, you don't really want to use, even if you've bleached the sucker, like it's just. Yeah, it's in the bowl already. And, yeah. And you, do you know what that's been? You know what's been over hovering over that thing, but also water beds. The problem with that water is those water. Do those even bladders, exist anymore? Bleach. I haven't seen a water bed for decades. I've seen a couple, but yeah, they're 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 pretty much an eighties era extinct. Bike, bike extinct. Yeah. Um, your swimming pools and your spas always always distill that water. Um. I just wouldn't, so I wouldn't drink it. A swimming pool has got way too much chlorine mm. to have it be, unless you, so that's why it's important to filter it out. So if, it's good to have, it's great that you have an above ground pool or an in ground pool, 
but the water is not going to be as drinkable in the as it is. So you got to have a way to uh, convert it to something. You got to distill it. That's yeah. honestly the best way. I've got a friend that has a big pool with a distillation system set up on the pool. Oh, nice for an emergency. So they can put that on and then take it off. But it's just a basically a tarp system that they built. Kind of ingenious. The evaporative um, system. Yeah, an evaporative system. So, <clears throat> but it takes a lot of energy, and you got to wait for it all to happen to be able to get any of that water, and it doesn't work. That, yeah. During certain times of the year. Yes. Yeah, so, so the so, the hardest part about storing water or in, a, in an extended emergency is what's your plan to get more, right? Yeah, it's easy enough to easy enough. It's it water is the hardest thing. I think food is easier than water. Um, mm -hmm. You can only store store a certain amount of water. You know, a month, two months is really really kind of pushing it. Uh, unless you're really diligent on changing your water and you have systems in place and so forth. But but having a plan to go get more, where are you going to go? I, I know our plan is I've got a river, you know, three miles from here. I've got a trailer. I can take my empty totes in my trailer and my water pump and go fill those suckers up and bring them back uh, in my enclosed trailer. And I have a, a, a spring that I can hike to about two miles from our house. So that's our plan for getting more water. Uh, the danger is when I come back to my neighborhood with another 500 gallons of water, everybody's going to want some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to go fast. Yeah. Well, I one mean, of the things that I, I took a class a few years ago, and it was pretty imp impressive because they found that statistically you're likely to have some type of rainfall every 90 days. Pretty much anywhere you live in the world, you're like likely to have either um, – Rain come, well, they did, the study said that either rain will come, resources from aid stations or aid units can come, um, or you'll find a local water supply such as a spring, a river, or something else you can get to and get water. Um, but I, I love, love using catchment off my roof to water my yard, to do other mm -hmm. stuff. But, like, we live in Utah, and it, it, it's been a lot rainy this year. Yeah, so far. But sometimes it's not very rainy, but when the when there is rain catch as much of it as you can yeah right? i would definitely scott you mentioned earlier to pull out a map and look around and you mm -hmm. know if you if you have a paper map great otherwise get onto google maps or whatever map service you want but look around for rivers uh, uh canals look around for ponding basins look around for reservoirs look look, look around for those things and, and find out what's within five miles ten miles and then recognize that you know there's I, you hear the stories even today where there's villages in you know Africa or wherever it is that these poor ladies have to hike for five miles or four hours they have to walk and they have these things over their shoulders and they carry the buckets and they come you know back and forth and mm -hmm. it's like we may have to go back to that and if that if it gets to that point and so you need to know where things are where other sources of water are so that you can take advantage of those even, you know, it's going to be a burden, but you need to, it's better to know that you can walk five miles and get a nice source of water and then walk home five miles than to sit there and think, oh my gosh, we're out of water. Now what do I do? I don't know which way to go. Like if you've already planned it out, you've already prepared, you know exactly where to go, you know exactly how to do it and you've planned your source yep. and you can get back and forth easy enough. So with that, what we want to do right now is remind you guys if you have questions, you need to jump into our into our group on Facebook, Emergency Prep and Self-Reliance, or go to our website, PrepperTalkRadio.com, go to the free resources, download our guide, because we even have a water storage calculator on there you can use for your family, and you can even enter notes on there once you've saved your copy, where your local water uh, refill places are, right? Where you can go get other water. Like in my case, I've got a couple of springs nearby and a couple of creek beds. They're not always running on the creek beds but i know when they are and i can get water really quickly when they are so make sure you have a plan and put your plan in place and that your whole family knows a plan how to resupply how to do all these things and then jump in the group and ask us questions there's there's so so much you can go into with water but this is the basics we wanted to cover with you today in this episode we hope that you found it very helpful uh, informative and honestly it's it's a topic that needs to be covered a lot more because people get their food storage first. I don't know why you need to get your first aid and then your water, but then you can get your food. There's no point in having food. If you're bleeding out, right? There's no point in having food. If you're dehydrated, mm -hmm. get your water. <laughs> yeah. And with that, 
Uh, we're going to sign out for the night. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being part of the Prepper Talk Radio family. Uh, we appreciate you. And don't forget to check out all the links below. Uh, we've got a lot of cool things down there you can check out and uh, some products we recommend as well as, of course, our fun videos on YouTube. So we'll catch you on the next episode. Until then, stay ready-minded. See you next week. <laughs>